So a lot of talk about MVP, NFL MVP, uh, early talk about MVP. I don't remember us talking MVP the way we are now two weeks into the season. It's crazy. Um, right. And, and you mentioned Dak. We saw Dak. You know, he's, he's, by the way, NFC Offensive Player of the Week the last week, 400 yards passing, three rushing touchdowns. I don't believe anybody ever done that before. So we'll Thank see if he Atlanta. keeps it up and he's, in the, and he's in the MVP conversation. But right now, he is my runaway leader for NFL Man of the Year. And let's talk about pulling back the curtain, like you always say. So when we were mm -hmm. preparing to launch this show two weeks ago, that was uh, when my former colleague at ESPN, he's now at Fox Sports 1, Skip Bayless, made his, un I'm not even going to say unfortunate comments, and I'll come back to that. I'll come back to it. Not unfortunate. And I, I know where you're going with it, too. Yeah, good. You're right. Yep. You're right. Made his comments uh, basically calling Dak weak for admitting that he struggled in the offseason after his brother's suicide, uh, struggled with depression and anxiety, especially in a pandemic. Gave the interview to my man, Graham Bensinger, a longtime friend of mine. But Dak uh, was very vulnerable, very open, very transparent about his struggles with mental health. And Skip Bayless went on television and, and called him weak. Uh, that led to a lot of people not only supporting Dak, but condemning Skip Bayless, and rightfully so, which led to Sunday. If you haven't seen it, I can't get enough of it. I'm going to start with Sunday, and then I'll go to yesterday, Michael, so follow me here. But let's okay. see. Sunday, after the game, after the Falcons completely collapsed against the Cowboys, tight end Hayden Hurst ran up to Dak Prescott and said this. Roll it. Hey. I got a lot of respect for what you Appreciate did. Came you. out and talked about me and my mom have a foundation about suicide prevention. Yeah. Respect the hell out of you Appreciate for talking you, about it, man. Collab one day. Absolutely. Come in. I mean, in those circumstances, after a heartbreaking loss, Hayden Hurst, just context, he's battled addiction, and he's attempted to commit suicide in 2016 while he was still at the University of South Carolina. His uncle and cousin committed suicide. So that's where that was coming from with Hayden Hurst, and he mentioned his parents' foundation. I'll get back to him in a second. But before we, we get into the conversation, Michael, now I want to okay. fast forward to yesterday. And somebody, a reporter, asked Aaron Rodgers, one of the faces and voices of the NFL, asked Aaron Rodgers about Dak Prescott's uh, sharing of his struggles with mental health and the, uh, the fallout from the Skip Bayless comments. So here's Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I mean, I think there's been a lot of players across the – uh, sporting leagues who who spoke out. You know, I know that uh, Kevin Love said some things a few years ago, and at the time, I remember the, some of the responses to it. There's there's a weird uh, uh, stigma around it. There's almost weakness to either ask for help or to admit you're struggling with things or admit uh, you know thoughts you might have that negative thoughts about yourself. Um, I think uh, this you know, strength is taking care of yourself and taking care of your mind and understanding how important your thoughts are because they become things and understanding uh, how important positivity is and your attitude and uh, waking up uh, each day with the right focus and the right mindset and taking time to be quiet during your day and whether it's five minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, you know, and, and still your mind, allow your, your brain to uh, rewire itself and, and change uh, you know, change the outlook and of the cells in your body, get them to get out of protection mode and into growth mode. Um, I think it's it's great. You know, when I saw what Dak said, I applaud him. I think is phenomenal speaking out because that's true courage and that's true strength. It's not a weakness at all. It's not, you know, and anybody who attacks it, uh, you know, that has other people's opinions of ourselves have really nothing to do with us. That's a great line I heard. Um, and other people's opinions of Dak has nothing to do with them. Those are their own insecurities about uh, their inability to deal with their own, probably. And I applaud, I applaud Dak, and and I think uh, Hurst as well had some words for him after the game. I think uh, it's a beautiful thing when people start talking about it, um, because I think at the at the bare minimum it makes you more relatable to people that. You know, we have the same struggles and the same issues and the same desires to grow and change and see things in a better positive light that so many people out there do. And I think the more that we can connect with people, especially on uh, conversations like this you're talking about, Matt, I think uh, the better our society can, can be moving forward as a connected uh, society built around love and positivity. I mean, I mean, I mean, seriously. 
So thank Great you, Courtney. Answer. I asked Courtney and Gary, I asked them, I wanted that entire answer. Aaron Rodgers just gave literally an impromptu therapy session, a clinic, right. a playbook on mental health. He gave you tips about quieting your mind, about positivity and rewiring your brain cells. I'm like, I'm taking notes. Michael, the beauty of that mm. commentary from Aaron Rodgers, Aaron Rodgers, the beauty of what Hayden Hurst did and saying, hey, and D Dak Prescott's response was, let's collab on something. We have no idea. When I say God only knows, I mean God only knows the lies that that moment between Hurst and Prescott and whatever collaboration they do between foundations and what Aaron Rodgers just said, God only knows the lies that, that will touch, change, and save just because of this ongoing conversation. That's why I said Skip Bayless's comments weren't necessarily unfortunate right. because it kept the important right. conversation going. Yeah, because it opened up it opened up all these lines of communication. And I, I would think that, first of all, you know, going back to Skip's comments, wow. Um, he he really he could have stopped at he could have stopped at this. Dak Prescott was depressed over his brother's suicide. Stop! Right there. That is a very human... Of course he was. Of course that is something that, to, that, that you're trying to process and you're trying to understand. Of course, so many questions. Nobody should scrutinize that. That's not up for scrutiny. That's not fair game. So, Mike, I thought just right there he was out of bounds. But to take it even further and say... Well, as a quarterback, you're the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. You can't have those emotions. I think that's ridiculous. And furthermore, I think anybody in the public eye, irony, anybody in the public eye, that would be somebody like Skip Bayless or somebody like Dak Prescott or Aaron Rodgers could benefit from therapy and, and, and focusing on mental health. Why? Mm. Because you have... You're, you are subject to someone giving an opinion on you every single day. Every day, somebody has something to say about you. Now, you can try to compartmentalize, yeah. but I, I don't think that's realistic. You can say, hey, they're talking about, they don't really know me. They're talking about Aaron Rodgers, Dak Prescott, Tom Brady, Lamar Jackson. They're talking about the quarterback of the team, but they're not talking about the real me. But we know, Mike, that, that that takes a toll on you. Oh yeah. So I, oh, I think yeah. everybody I think everybody, whether you're a professional athlete or not, I think I think therapy is is such a uh, important essential thing just to understand what's going on inside of you, to understand why you make the certain certain decisions that you make. And, and it could be certain patterns that you have. Yeah. Uh, it, it's almost like um, kind of like doing your your own anthropology, you know, just kind of going in there and, and just being reflective and thinking, oh, oh, that's why. That's why I, yeah. I, I, I continue to do these, make these decisions. And it just opens up so much, uh, so many other things for you and puts you more at peace. Can I come, can I come back to that? Do you mind? Like, yeah. I, look, can I, can I, can I, I, I want to park that for a second. Yeah, park and right then, there on that oh, curve. I didn't see that tweet from, that, the, keep, look at Hayden Hurst. Let's make a car. difference, brother. Keep the car yeah, running. Keep that, keep, yeah, keep it, keep it running. Keep the meter running there because I, I want to go, I don't want to forget it, but there's a lot of things I want to cover. You said a lot there, a lot of great stuff that I want to I wanna unpack a little bit more. Let's start with uh, just the conversation, which is as important a conversation as being had in professional sports right now is that of mental health. And you've had people like Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan. The NBA, as usual, you know, being the blackest league and, quite honestly, the most progressive league. I think those two things very much go hand in hand. At times, um, at times. But anyway, go on, at, me. at times. Well, go ahead. I, well, I'm talking about just in terms of some of the conversations that are had. A lot of, a lot yeah. of social, yeah. political, cultural conversations emanate, in sports at least, emanate from the, NF, the NBA a lot of yeah. times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other things. So what was awesome about, it's, it's two things. What was awesome about the NBA's conversation about mental health is that and the reason I bring up it being the blackest league is just like that opens a door for conversation about mental health in the black community, which is a yeah. separate conversation in and of itself, which is why I'm going to come back to the therapy thing in a second with you. So let's recognize that the NBA has been having this conversation 
Uh, and there's a lot of black players opening up about it. DeMar DeRozan, hell, even Paul George re most recently talked about the struggles of just being in a bubble. And, and, you know, a lot of people, you know, confine mental health to clinical and diagnosed depression or anxiety. Sometimes it's just your day-to-day well-being, which we talked about with Vinny. We talked about the last two days. As black people, we need therapy. We have generational trauma that is genetically a part of who we are. So let's, so, okay, so there's that. But then on the NFL part, what I love is like, this is true toughness. This is true manhood. This is the epitome of leadership. This is masculinity, is being vulnerable. There's strength in your weakness. Yes. And, and, and yes. some of the toughest players, some of the toughest people on the planet opening up and talking about their vulnerability. So I think it takes on a different level of strength, a different level of significance for that discussion to be had in football, in pro football, where you're never supposed to show weakness. And that's that caveman mentality that Skip was bringing to the table. You're never supposed to show weakness or vulnerability, never give an edge. We're talking about a sport that, you know, the injury report is always fake. You know, they lie on the injury report because they don't want to give anybody a competitive advantage. You know, well, but is there the a problem mental... there? But, is, it, and, but is, there a, is there a problem with the league, though? Is there a problem with the league not really producing that type of atmosphere where... It's just the culture uh, of the game. Or, it's, just, it's just the way they make Prescott doesn't feel comfortable. Well, I mean, he did. He came out and he said it. But it, it, it's, it's amazing that a quarterback in the league would come out and say that because it's, the NFL generally uh, is not the, 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 the space... I, I, I don't know if it's the NFL. I don't know if it's that. the league. I don't know if it's the NFL or the Players Association. I think it's the culture around it, and, that, and that's the fans. And I think the, and the fans, the commentary around it, it's just it's not associated with vulnerability um, or weakness. And it's not a weakness. Excuse me. I don't even want to meet anybody. It's not a, associated with that with that type of transparency. Okay, it perceived quote unquote. I want to yeah. stress, stress that perceived right. weakness because like, you know the players' association has all kinds of programs, but I think they're still catching up to the NBA. To your point, though, when it comes to being at the forefront of that all important conversation, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things where, and and, and going back to the Skip Bayless thing. Listen, man, and I told you this, and, and our producers are learning this about me. In my entire career, I have never, I, I don't want to cuss, but what somebody poops don't make, what somebody eats don't make me right. poop. I say that all the time. I am not one of those people, not one of those people that respond to what this talking head said or, or, or this loud mouth said or this idiot said. I'm not that dude, man. I don't care. All I care about is what you have to say and what I have to say and what people I respect have to say. That's all I care about. Right. So... At first, when this came up, and I know we weren't on the air, but I was like, yo, I, I, I wouldn't ordinarily respond to something Skip said because I don't listen to Skip. But this was important to, to respond to. This was important for people to shout down because those attitudes that Skip brought to the table are the reason why so many people suffer and struggle in shame and in silence. That stigma that Aaron Rodgers was talking about. And so I'm grateful to Skip Bayless for not only exposing yourself, but exposing just how far we have to go as a society, for people to not look down upon and judge and stigmatize people who struggle with mental health. Because again, Skip Bayless, whether he knows it or not, what he said might have been meant for harm, but it's been turned into a good because whether he knows it or not, Skip Bayless saved lives. Skip Bayless changed lives. His ignorance kept the conversation going and let people know you're not alone in this. You're not alone. Like, like it's okay. It's okay to come come out and, and and share your struggles and express what you're going through and talk to somebody and talk about what you're going through and don't worry about idiots like this because there are more people that are here for you for you and relate to you than that will judge you. Yeah, I wonder. Uh, and you're right, but I wonder how many people will will take that. Will will listen to what he said and l listen to that point of view. I don't. I don't. No, no, it's not, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not that they'll hear what Skip said and, and, and look at it that way. I'm talking about what's transpired since then. No, no, I, no, I, I love, I, hate, no, I love that yeah, part. That's what I mean. No, yeah. No, yeah. I, no I, I got you. I got you. I love, I okay. love that, that, that Hayden Hurst is going up to Dak Prescott. Yes. And they, they're talking about, hey, let's get More together. people wrote that, about it because of Skip's BS. They wrote about it. I love what Aaron Rodgers. It. It, it had a life of its own. Yeah. But, you know, here's the thing. This is why... Uh, that's, that's why I'm saying I wonder if people will take what Skip said and, and really take it to heart because the pushback that he got was pretty overwhelming and immediate. And it wouldn't have always, it wouldn't have been like that 10 years ago. 
I mean, mm-hmm. so maybe maybe it's 50-50 yeah. uh, 10 years ago. But I, ha- I didn't hear anybody say, you know, Skip brings up an interesting point. I didn't hear anybody say that. So I think, I think yeah. we're starting to figure it out that any kind of, uh, 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 any kind of hood, uh, womanhood, uh, manhood requires yeah. bringing all of yourself, all of yourself to a conversation, all of yourself to a situation. It is not, you can't just say, well, a real man would do fill in the blank. It, that doesn't exist. It, doesn't, it, it depends mm-hmm. on, you know, where you grew up and what you're going through and how you perceive situations. And if you are somebody who says, hey, wait a minute, I'm really struggling. I, mean, I don't think that takes away, that doesn't take away anything. It doesn't take away your strength. It doesn't take away your perspective. It doesn't all. take away your resolve. And I think most people, I think a lot of, well, I shouldn't say that, most, but a lot of people are realizing that now. And we didn't always have More, that yes. conversation. We're evolving. We're evolving. Still somewhere to go. So I want to go back to, you spoke eloquently, very eloquently, about the value of therapy. Do, if I may ask, do you do you have a therapist? You know what, Mike? Uh, you can, Of course, you said, if I may ask. What do I keep saying about this show? There are no secrets on this I know, show. I know, I, I know, right. I know. So here's the story. This is what happened. Uh, unfortunately, COVID struck because I made a decision, um, you know, this year. I said, okay, this is going to be the year. I'm going to go to therapy. I just want to go to therapy. I mm. think it'll be good for me. Just kind of mm-hmm. understand some things in my life, you know, deal with uh, some thoughts that I have. I'm going to go to therapy, and then COVID struck. And so I really, I, I want to do it, and I don't want to meet my therapist for the first time over Zoom. I'm going to rebel against Zoom in that situation, but I am going to do it, and I recommend, um, I, I recommend it. So I am, I've got it, you know what, Mike, I've got it narrowed down, um, and it's just too bad your technology would go out. This is like our phone conversations. Just when I'm telling you something, just when I'm telling you something good, your phone goes out. But I will say this before uh, before we take a break and then come back. Um, I, can't, I forgot what I was going to say. All right, let's take a break. Let's take a break. We'll come back. Maybe Michael Smith can hear me. And I'll tell all my secrets to him. And I hope he can listen. For a second there. I read your lips for a second. Yeah. I, I think I know what you said. You said it's just like when we're on the phone and yeah. the signal drops out. So, it, yeah, it, I, you know, lot. maybe it is appropriate. This is two dudes on the phone. That's what we're talking like. So, right. two, two what were you saying, Michael? I, yeah. yeah. I, I asked we, we, you we got if it. you had... Uh... Yeah, you asked, me, you asked me if I've gone to therapy. Uh, yeah. And I said, um, I said yes. That, that is it's the plan. The plan is for me to do it. You know, I, I decided this year, my birthday's in February. I said, okay, after my birthday, I'm going to do it. And then right after my birthday, as you guys know, uh, the world changed, our country changed, COVID strikes. And I didn't want to meet my therapist for the first time over Zoom. So uh, as soon as we mm-hmm. get past this thing, uh, that is something I'm going to do. We, we got a moment of, of, of levity that we didn't ask for in the middle of an important conversation. But I'll, t- I'll tell you why, Mike, uh, in all seriousness, I'll tell you why one of the reasons why I decided that I wanted I want to do it. And you know this about me, but everybody doesn't. Um, my, I really have no relationship with my father. And I want to be a great father. I have three kids. And part of it, part of it was uh, becoming a great father, in my opinion. Part of it was doing the opposite of what I saw growing up. Mm. So, and, and, I, and the number one thing was, was being present. Just that uh, the the lack of presence uh, from my father was so impactful uh, in in a negative way. I, I vowed that I would never do that. I, I'll, I'll share this with you, uh, you and everybody else. I, I went to a retreat uh, probably about uh, you know, probably ten or fifteen years ago, a men's retreat fifteen years ago, and I found I recently found the uh, notebook from it, and it was talking about fatherhood, Mike. And one of the questions on there was, uh, except about four or five questions, and I looked at my answers, and I said, wow, like, how did I answer like that? How do you just answer this question so casually? Question was, what's your father's favorite color? What's your father's favorite food? How many times did your father hug you? How many times did your father tell you he loved you? Don't know his favorite color, don't know his favorite food. (laughs) 
uh, never got a hug, never got an I love you. And so I think those are the things. Now, that, that's just part of it. Everybody's got their own story of why, you know, some type of mental health, some type of talking with some professional is important. For me, that's the most important thing. And I have a, a great relationship uh, with my wife and with my children, but I just want to make sure I'm staying on top of it and I understand more about myself. So thanks for asking well, that question. The, yeah, no, I mean, the thing, the thing that I had to even, you know, repent, change my mind about um, as an adult was the idea that therapy is only if you, quote unquote, have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, that it's, that if you are depressed or, you know, you're, you're at your lowest, maybe I should see a therapist, which is the, as many have pointed out, which is equivalent of saying, oh, I'm sick, I should see a doctor. It's like, no, you should see a doctor all the time for maintenance. So you should see a, a, a mental health professional for maintenance, just to make sure you're always good. It's just healthy. That's it's right. a healthy habit. It's healthy living. Having said all that, I don't have a therapist. I've never been to a therapist because the first thing I would ask a therapist to fix, quite frankly, is my procrastination, which I plan to work on tomorrow. Uh, I, all, I just have a, I have a thing. It's just my, my <laughs> worst habit is, is right. that I procrastinate. <laughs> it is my worst habit. I've always put it off. But I'll tell you, you know, there were, the, the last few years, and you know this, I mean, because I, you know, talk to you through it. The last few years, I've, I've gone to some pretty dark places. I don't know if it would be necessarily characterized as depression or anxiety. I don't know, but I just know that I, I had some days where I didn't feel like getting out of bed and I had some nights where I couldn't go to sleep. And so um, I knew that it's like, man, I'm overdue. Let's put it that way. I'm overdue to see a therapist. Um, closest I, I got was I did hire an executive coach, Julie Mangini, by the way. Eric Mangini's oh, wife. Right? Incredible. Oh, my gosh, she's incredible. Oh, she's incredible. She was incredible before that, but getting to know her in this capacity, oh, my God. Um, I highly recommend her. Um, Watershed um, is, her, is her company's name, I believe. Um, but, yeah, I, 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 I did not, I never got around to seeing a therapist. I know I need it. And the other part of it, too, going back to just how we were brought up, man, I mean, you and I both grew up in the church, and uh, certainly black people are not a monolith. I don't want to suggest that. But there is across the board, it always Definitely. has been across the board, a stigma attached yep. to, a stigma attached to black men in particular when it comes to yep. vulnerability and, and, no and crying or emotion or whatever. Black people in general, there's a stigma when it comes to mental health. There's a, well, mental and, and, and professional, uh, excuse me, mental and physical health. Remember earlier when I was talking about systemic racism, you know, not just being about police brutality, you know, there, there's a black woman somewhere right now being denied proper health care. We have a very complicated relationship, relationship with, medic, with the medical industry, with, with, with health yeah. professionals, but also just in the church in particular. We just pray about it. Yeah, just pray right. about it. Exactly. You know, Jesus, is, Jesus, Jesus is the only friend you need. Just pray about it. And that, and that, was, the, that was our mental health. That was our yeah, answer certainly. to therapy was our relationship with the Lord. And so... Yeah. I grew up with this idea that y if you need a therapist, then something's wrong with you, you know, as opposed to just like, no, it's healthy to talk to somebody that's not your pastor, especially, you know, in, in our, you know, you and I are both, are both Christians, you know, there, there's no intermediary. There, we have intercessors, but there's not an intermediary between us and God. So the most therapy you may get or counseling you may get is with your pastor, but not with a designated mental health professional. So that was, that's hurdles that we have in our community Oof. that have oh, to be overcome you, as well. You are, you are speaking the truth today. I thought you were about to say as well that certain things just aren't supposed to be talked about. You know, you know yeah. don't, don't yeah. bring that up. You know, you can, you can only take it so far, but don't bring that up here because uh, this is just not the space for that. So I'm glad, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that, Back to what you said, I'm glad that we got here, even though we got here in a very odd and a very twisted way with, with a commentator criticizing an athlete who is willing to be vulnerable. I think it has opened up a lot of conversations, not just in football, but across sports and, and across many yeah. industries.